Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson, and we're here tonight for a special event to talk about the importance of housing. The Institute was created by Congressman Bill Young as a space for people to understand the appropriate scope of government. We're really grateful to our president, Dr. Williams, for allowing us the opportunity to utilize so many spaces on our campuses to educate, engage, and enhance the community. Tonight, we're gonna get started and thank our partners first. We are blessed to have a very strong panel of amazing panelists, and you will see that we partnered with Amplify Clearwater, the Downtown Partnership, Treasure Island, and Madeira Beach Chamber of Commerce, and HCA, and we have been actually meeting for some months now, right, Jason? I had to read that to make sure I get everyone's names right. Um, to have a conversation on, there's been so many talks about housing and how could we make this different and meaningful for it to be solution oriented. You're gonna have some information that we were able to gather. There's a QR code. So if you'll take a moment to scan the QR code and that QR code has information on housing. And if there's any other information that you'd like to add or you'd like to give to us later on, we're happy to try to add that to the information when we put it on our website. And with that, we're going to get going with introducing our panel. As I said, our community is going through what I call a titanic geographic shift. And that means that there are very important discussions to be had about housing and how our community is going to look different and how we're inclusive with the change in our community. So I'd like to introduce our panel. And our first guest is Sean King. Sean is um, amazingly here to talk about Habitat for Humanity, correct? <laughs> and some of the, um, the benefits and support um, that we have. And then I'd like to go next to Evan Johnson, who I just met, who's so gonna add to the conversation and round up the conversation. We also have Barkley Harless, who's gonna talk from, I guess, a finance perspective, yes. And we have Jason Mathis, who's going to actually do the moderation of the event. Um, I want to again thank you for taking the time to really evaluate this at the Institute. We hope that at some point you come back and revisit our website, learn more about us, but most importantly, engage in the conversation. And with that, Jason, I'm going to ask you to take it away. Thank you. It's a really important topic, as Kim said, and we wanted to differentiate because so frequently conversations about housing devolve into a litany of, of just what the problem is. It's, we just talk a lot about the problem, and I think everyone in this room is there anyone in this room who doesn't think that we have a problem with housing availability and affordability tonight? No. So we know that there's a problem. So we want to spend the next hour really focused on solutions and trying to think about what those solutions might look like. We have three incredible panelists who have been given some questions in advance. It's going to be a little bit of a free-flowing conversation. I'm probably not going to ask all of the questions because I don't think we'll have time for that. But I wanted to start out just talking about the law of supply and demand would sort of indicate that if there is demand for something like housing at a certain price point, that the private sector would step up and fill that, that need, that the private sector would solve that problem. That doesn't seem to be happening here. So let's talk a little bit about why that's not happening, and then we're going to get right into solutions of what that might look like. Evan, do you want to start with that? You're scribbling notes. That makes me think you've got something important to say. Um, yeah, you learned my trick. I always scribble notes and it makes people think that I'm thinking about something. Um, no, I think, uh, so I work with Pinellas County. Uh, I'm planning division manager for Pinellas County uh, out of Clearwater. We do work in the unincorporated area, um, including places like Loman to the south and unincorporated Seminole, but also we do a lot of work with all of our cities um, when it comes to coordinating on things like housing. You know, I think there's, there's a couple of issues. I mean, there's a lot of issues, and I'm sure these other uh, very smart gentlemen will uh, speak to many of them. I'll speak from my perspective. One, I do think there's an issue with regulation. I think that we recognized at the county um, that there are places, processes and places where we can streamline and make things move faster, particularly for projects that we really would like to see. So we have uh, affordable housing incentives that are regulatory incentives, trying to speed up those processes to help people like Sean uh, get through the process more. Now, he will tell you plenty of stories about how we have not done that at times, but I think that's a big part of it. I think we have a, nim a NIMBY sentiment, um, you know, not in my backyard. There is a lot of neighborhood opposition, uh, in particularly in certain places in the county. So St. Pete has a very strong neighborhood uh, 
uh, community that gets out, and if they don't like something, they're going to let you know. And, that, and that's throughout the county. You know, we have uh, beach communities oftentimes, a little less density, people have bigger houses. They just they worry about having that new density, that new intensity. So I think NIMBY is a big deal. Finding where to put new housing uh, in the future as we move forward is going to be really, really important. So I would start with uh, those two things. The other thing that always seems to happen is that supply and demand, it's true. The market, there's a lot of housing being built. There are, well, until recently, there are a lot of investors in the market. But also, everything seems to slow down at once. So suddenly, we're going to maybe get, uh, maybe, maybe there's not quite as much speculation in the market, but the developers start slowing down production, right? Because they have now found that it's cost more, there's not as much demand. And so it is a, it's a negative feedback loop in this time because people start stepping back a little bit. So we end up just kind of following this up and down pattern oftentimes. And I don't have any solutions for that yet. But I do think that's one of the challenges is that, you know, right when we're ready and we're like, oh, land's cheaper and things like that, well, there's not as much interest in the market. So I think that's something we're always going to have to struggle with. Yeah. Um, I, I could probably go on for a while on this. Um, regulation is definitely part of it. Um, the question was basically, if I, I recall, supply and demand, why isn't the free market taking care of it, stepped up and taking care of it? And I think they have at certain levels. I think you see that at the higher end of the market. Um, when you look at the developments that are being built, whether that's um, market rate home ownership or, or market rate rental, and you see that supply coming online um, at that higher end. Where, where you don't see it coming online is lower down um, you know, the, the area median income or the AMI. So I think you know, the other thing that I don't know if we've really gotten our hands around the community and we've heard about a lot, uh, I haven't seen real data on this, but when you look at regulation and you look at larger um, either REITs or other investment vehicles that are coming in, they have realized across the country that, hey, there's this regulatory framework of single family housing and single family zoning. So if we go and purchase single family homes, they're not going to change and we can rent them out and we can kind of control the supply of the market. So I think there's some sort of, and everybody I will just say is looking for this silver bullet problem uh, and silver bullet solution. And it's not going it, to, it, it's multifaceted and it's on all levels. So I would say it is working on the higher end of the market and you see market participants come in and build but on the lower end where the margins get really really tight um, and the risk is higher you don't see those that supply online and i think that's why we're kind of all here today barkley as, as a banker what's what's your take on this or just just a wise individual you don't have to always wear your banker hat well what they said of course yeah. you know um no i i think that uh why, why, why is the market happening like this? So demand drives supply. People aren't just going to build homes because they hope that people are going to buy them, right? That's not how it works. And Pinellas County is basically Hawaii with three bridges. There's no extra land, so you're already limiting supply that way. And additionally, you've got a hurricane that's hitting an area that's under a plague, and there's a gas spill in the, in the Gulf, right? It's a, I'm 37 years old. Uh, interest rates have gone faster this year than at any point in my life. That is a, what's called a once in a 50 year event, right after COVID. And you had, um, I think, similar to, I was not in banking uh, during the, before the Great Recession. Um, but you had irresponsible market actors, banks, who were lending out to people uh, irresponsible. And I think what you may have had in Pinellas County in the past, call it 24 months, is uh, irresponsible market actors. If someone wants to buy a house for 10 or 15% over what the appraised actual value is, right, and they're buying in cash, a lot of people could say, well, that's, that's okay. That's okay. That's their money. That's their right. What if a lot of people are doing that? You've now artificially inflated the price of because of irresponsible market activity. And it's not illegal, it's not even really wrong. But it has created a, a hurricane 
while we're having a plague, while there's a spill. And so I think... I Sean's comment is, I think, brilliant about a silver bullet. Um, the demand side is certainly there. It's just been completely out of whack. And you've had a supply side that's been suffering and recovering from the Great Recession over 10 years. And um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It hasn't happened before. And so um, there's a lot of questions. So that, I think, set the context for what the challenges are. I want to spend the next set of questions really talking about what are the solutions. So speaking not just on behalf of Habitat for Humanity, but of nonprofit housing providers, low-income housing providers, affordable housing providers, Sean, What's the nonprofit sector doing to try to solve this? What are, what are things you have been doing in the past? You, have, you know, Habitat has a long history of success. And maybe more importantly, what are, what are things you're trying to do now to get around this problem and to, and to really try to solve this? So, I'll, you know, it's unique with Pinellas County. So we're 24, 25, different, I, I lose count every day. And it's difficult for um, a, a affordable housing developer to develop affordable housing as it is, right? So we say, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. It's not. Um, there is layers of um, f funding and regulation and compliance and all that good stuff. But I think in Pinellas County specifically, it's difficult because of the different municipalities. So we have, you know, 24, 25, whatever it is, but even within that there's different funding mechanisms. So just so everybody in this room knows and is clear, most of the affordable housing funding that cities use do not come from the cities. Most cities, almost all of them, spend zero dollars of their general revenue on actual affordable housing. It comes from other places as kind of pass-through dollars. So it'll come from HUD, the federal government, as block grants, it'll come from the state, um, SHIP, Sadowski funding, if you followed that, and it'll come down and through that. So, you know, there's regulations attached. Within Pinellas, what is specifically difficult is Pinellas County does things differently than St. Pete, that does things differently than Largo, that does things differently than Clearwater. So you could literally be building a house on one side of the road, and you're dealing with a different Evan, right? You're dealing with a different housing department. You're dealing with a different funding, different regulations, all of that kind of stuff. This is more to the problem, right? Yeah, you, they're, but they're, they're one of the solutions I think that Pinellas County has embarked on and, and the county as a whole, and Evan was leading this, is a, a countywide housing compact, right? So the first round of that housing compact was just to get the municipalities to sign on board. Um, and Evan can talk more about the the nuts and bolts of it, uh, but it's basically getting the larger jurisdictions to say, hey, we need a countywide strategy. So it's not different funding from Pinellas Park to Largo to Clearwater. You know, it's the same application, it's the same process, it gives some regulatory uh, framework and, and, you know, it's, it's easier to build throughout. That's like step one. So let's just get everybody in the room and figure out, I can tell you right now, uh, when we put in a funding application, all of the municipalities use this system called Neighborly. They're all different logins, they're all different forms, even though we're trying to do the same thing. So like low hanging fruit solution for me today, nonprofit, would be like streamline the funding form, make it one, like <laughs> make it consistent so we can just do it one time and it doesn't matter whether we're in Madeira Beach or wherever. So. There, there are things like that that I think are happening and can occur, uh, but for Pinellas County specifically, I think it's just aligning all of the municipalities to have a county-wide strategy and execute on that strategy, and we're not there yet. So Evan, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Like what's the, it sounds like you've got a great plan. Um, yeah, so we started uh, maybe under the Board of County Commissioners has really encouraged us as staff to move forward with the countywide strategy to housing the best we can. Now, we as the county do not control the municipalities, so it's much more about partnership and, and collaboration moving forward. But with the housing compact, essentially it is a compact that says, and we've got the major jurisdictions on board, uh, all the big names, um, it says that we're actually gonna do that coordination moving forward. And, and when we talk about folks like Sean, who are out there and, and any developer, they really do. They, Clearwater's got one set of land development regulations. 
you come over to the unincorporated county, we have the different one. We're all going to have different building and development review processes and all of that. And some of that, we're just not going to be able to change completely. You know, maybe we submit, you know, you submit your plans to Clearwater and maybe they review it a little bit more consistently with how we do it. But they're still legally are going to still have their land development authority, right? But I do think that, you know, our goal is really to not only to, A, change the language so that we're all talking about affordable housing the same way, but hopefully to align our incentives and our processes, particularly when targeted at affordable housing in the same way. Right now, I just was reading this today from a colleague at Clearwater. There are, uh, we have density bonuses in all of our codes. We're allowed, we have it in our uh, long range plans, which are our land use plans, and then we have them in our codes. City of Clearwater has a certain matrix they use. City of Largo has a different one. We are getting ready to redo ours. City of St. Pete has a different one as well. So not only that, but if you're somebody like Sean or a bigger developer, especially from out of town, changes the dynamic of you know, what you can get jurisdiction to your jurisdiction amongst all the other things like landscaping and prep and all that other stuff. So I do think there's a lot of advantage to um, working together in that way to make it a more common you know, aligned language between us all. Because ultimately, we want to see folks like him and others succeed as quickly as possible. I did want to mention that um, he is correct that most of the funding that we deal with um, in the county's community development folks covers uh, unincorporated county. Also, we have a, a partnership with Largo and things like that. But it's all different funding. It all has, we all are responsible for our own funding that comes in. So at the end of the day, the state, the feds are going to be looking to the cities or the county to make sure that we spent it correctly um, and that we're tracking it and compliance and all of that. Um, but the county has, uh, the county commission approved with this penny for Pinellas, which runs from 2020 to 2030. They did approve a set aside for countywide housing, for affordable housing support. And so it's, a, it's because it collects every year over the 10 year period. It's, you know, you can't name an actual number, but the estimates are around $88 million. So eight to $10 million a year, depending on the year. And, and so far, sales tax has been pretty good. Um, but ultimately, that fund is something that we administer, but is countywide, and we've worked with multiple municipalities to help, and it is much more flexible than HUD rules and the state's rules. That's the intent, at least, is to try to have that be the more flexible dollar. But that is an example of, of commitment from the county commission to set aside a, a decent chunk of money. I will also say St. Pete's done a great job with with a lot of their ARPA dollars um, and a lot of the money they've received from the federal government as far as in infusing it into housing as well, so. Yes, and I will stand corrected on Pen Penny for Pinellas, which is uh, a tax that we all pay. Uh, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, most of the municipalities outside of Pinellas County are some through other pass-through dollars. And even to Evan's point, they're still using penny money, so county funds in their local municipality. So I'm just saying put, put up some money. It's an easy one. <laughs> so fix, fix funding, fix regulation. Those would be good. Those would be good first steps, right? Fix financing. Okay. So let's. So Barkley, let's talk a little bit about what the private sector's role is, because it's not. I think it's it's too easy to say. Well, it's just the government's fault, or the government needs to solve this. The government can't solve it. It's way too big. From your perspective as a banker and as a business leader, what what's the private sector's role in this? Because the private sector. And I think lots of folks in this room can attest to this. The private sector is really hurting. You may be fine, but it's hard for your employees. It's hard to recruit people. It's, I mean, there's, there are effects on business because of the housing challenge. So talk a little bit about from your perspective. Sure. Well, um, I, I witness it. I witness it with employees. Uh, I witness it with we have restaurant clients in St. Pete, and they are like, hey, my hostess wants 18 or 19 an hour. That's what they're willing to stay for. Um, because their housing costs have gone up. And so then the restaurant has to raise prices, which means everybody else pays more, which means housing goes up and it's a vicious cycle and never stops. So um, I can talk about a couple things. I can talk about things that uh, I've been involved in in the past that have worked, and then some things that are working now, um, that continue to work now. Um, you know, there are special mortgages out there. I used to call them special. They're regulated 30-year um, fixed rate mortgages that are fully underwritten, um, but that allow first-time home buyers or folks who may have uh, challenged credit scores to uh, still make home ownership a, a viability. And that program has come under a lot of strain, uh, mostly because 
of the market. You know, when you have census tracts that are listed as low to moderate income, uh, these mortgages basically can apply there or to the people who uh, qualify and they have certain incomes. Well, we lost about 70% of those census tracts in St. Pete, gone. And so that activity now is much more limited. And in addition, um, on the income that's available, I think it's somewhere in the mid 60s. And I did the math on Zillow using the mortgage calculator. And basically, you can get uh, about a $200,000 home qualifying uh, with that income. And um, that's uh, with no property, uh, private mortgage insurance. There's all sorts of attractive things that, that are out there to prevent uh, some of the more um, common occurrences from someone getting in the house. Now, those mortgages have, have basically gone away in the past 12 months. Not, the, not the, the products, but the fact that people haven't been able to get under contract because they were being outbid by people with cash or several of the bids and they were there with the bank loan, so the seller went with somebody else. Um, and now the issue is property insurance has gone up a lot. Obviously, interest rates have doubled, and so now there's a whole new thing. So those programs aren't working anymore, even though they haven't changed at all. The market has changed so dramatically that they're not Im being impactful. Um, we do, I have been involved with um, a developer, uh, some developers that work with city government. The city will contribute property uh, as a part of a project um, for for sale homes. Uh, the one in particular I'm thinking of is in Pinellas Park. Um, I've also got some smaller uh, operating uh, developers who work with the city of St. Pete and the city incentivizes, basically controls the end user of that property. And so, I know that's not a good solution. It's happening. It's happening only because um, you're able to get around the market. You know, I was reading today about the project that Habitat's involved with in, uh, next to the TROP site. I forgot that specific, Shell Dash Shell is what it's called. And two glaring things that just shocked me about that and, and I, why I understand it's, it's, it's working. One, the city contributed a million dollars. And number two, the interest rate that Habitat's able to provide those folks is zero percent. And those are going for six, seven percent now. That is a seismic shift. So, you know, we still have, as, as banks, we still have obligations to, you know, get involved in financing in all aspects of the community. The, the issue is, is that the, the, what's worked is no longer working. And it's not because of anything other than the market in Pinellas County has changed so dramatically. So, you know, I hate to, deliver it back to the government, but the government, if it's a public good, can still work with private developers to make these things work. Um, like I said, it's just you're in a fifth, once in 50 year event, you know, how do you deal with that? So can I beat up on the banks in Barclay a little bit and then give maybe some solutions here? You know, one of the, one of the issues um, specifically around home ownership is access to credit, right? You have to have the credit to get into a home. One of, you know, in Pinellas County specifically, we have um, a home ownership gap between uh, white homeowners and African American black homeowners that is lagging both the state average and the, the national average. So we're doing worse in Pinellas County than the state overall and the nation overall. And I think we're, the last time I checked, we were like seventh out of eighth in our eight county region here. So we can do a lot better. Part of that is structural and historic things that have gone on way before any of us were here. But another part of that is credit rating system, bank underwriting, and you led to that. You know, so, And you're starting to see a shift. And the banker will say, will tell you like, hey, we're just looking at these credit scores. We're check, you know, these are the boxes that got to check. But when you kind of look under the hood of that, you know, they've done studies and rental incomes tend to be the greatest, or rental payment history tend to be the greatest predictors of mortgage delinquencies in the, you know, moving forward. Well, what doesn't get reported on your credit? Rent. So, you know, you could have this awesome rent history, never miss the payment, but you forgot to turn in the spectrum box from five years ago, which we see all the time, and that hits your credit report, right? You know what else hits your credit report? When you don't make a payment to your, your landlord. So there's this the inverse kind of things that need to get fixed through the system, which is 
bigger than this room most likely, but just kind of gives you, tells a story and helps paint a picture of, you know, access to credit is a huge one um, that we can help tackle. The other one I will say um, to your kind of initial point of, or question of what can the private sector do, we have a lot of we chambers here, downtown partnerships, right? This is business community. We have siloed, and this is changing, but we have siloed economic development and housing, traditionally. Those two areas, hey, we need an economic development incentive to bring this manufacturing plant so we can bring jobs. Great, done, tax break, done. What happens? We don't have any housing for these people, right? So two things happen. They live somewhere else, and then they'll commute for a while, and then they'll find a job in that area. Or two, which is probably even worse, is we've given this incentive in St. Pete or Clearwater, wherever, and the person lives in Pasco or another county, so they come here to work, and then they take their money that they earned at the job back into another county, right, or another municipality. So I think we need to, this is a takeaway I think we can have coming out of this, is that we need to continue to marry economic development and housing. They go hand in hand. You can't have really one without the other or do it successfully long term. And I think we're feeling that pain here locally because that's why we're seeing, you know, Pasco grow and Apollo Beach and all these other communities that historically have been sort of bedroom communities for Pinellas and Hillsville. Well, I, I would just add to that, um, you know, we in government are, we've already talked about financial incentives, we've talked about regulatory incentives, we've yet to talk about new requirements because that's really not where our conversation is. We're trying to make it as easy and facilitate the market as much as we can. But to Sean's point, we have to, as a community, find a way to get the private sector, the business community involved in helping solve the problem. Because whether that's through funding, whether that's through land, whether that's through some other program and process, some companies, you've seen it around Florida, they're building housing for employees, right? And that's happening in some locations. Of course, Disney is probably the biggest example in, in the state, but it's not just Disney. It's all over the state. There's little companies trying to get together to find a way to how do we keep our mechanics or our manufacturing workers uh, near us so that they stay because you know, you can't work from home when you're doing manufacturing. I live in Tampa, I drive to Clearwater, but I only have to do it a couple days a week, you know? Whereas somebody in the manufacturing industry has to be there every day, and that's a challenge. So I, I don't, I know that you all are a part of that business community that is such a key to the long-term success. How do you get the hotels, the major Fortune 500 employers, et cetera, to play a more active role in it? Because I think that's the only way we're really gonna make those you know, Lord, we got to get that momentum of the private sector behind us too. So we want to reserve some time for a conversation. We've got a great group of people here. It's it's a little bit intimate. We can we can talk. So I have one last question. Then I'm going to turn it back over to Kim, who's going to manage the um, the audience question and answer. My last question for each of you. We'll start with you, Barkley, down on the end. Is <clears throat> if you had one big idea, one magic wand that you could wave. Don't no, nothing is impossible. What would you do to improve housing availability and affordability in Pinellas County? Uh, I would do two things. Um, number one, traditionally home mortgages, and I'm not in the home mortgage industry, so I'm not the expert, but they're 30-year amortization. Uh, I know one of the ways that HUD finances larger projects is by going out 40 years. Um, I don't know if that, I haven't heard that conversation much, but that is one way of stretching out the payments to deal with this once in 50 year issue. Um, I think the, the other piece uh, there is if, if government and different levels of government had the ability to find dedicated revenue streams. So in all these areas, we've got major projects going on. You know, if you allow luxury condos as a piece of that, and then you tax those luxury condos with the special tax increment, and that money is guaranteed to be used for land acquisition by the city to make these deals that are still happening today happen. That's one way of doing that. Now, the problem is, is that in Florida, we have a great reputation. Sadowski was done in 1992. And I think this year they used like half the money and they were like 
patting themselves. They really thought they were doing a great job. And so, you know, there's an unfortunate history in Florida of these types of programs being set up and then not honored uh, the way that they were originally developed. And so I would suggest that that's a great way for, there's a lot of developers out there who are actively talking about incorporating workforce, affordable, you know, whatever kind of uh, local government um, requirements or incentives are being placed. And there's just not that many because there's just not that much land. And so I think, you know, those, those sort of dedicated funding streams would be uh, the gift that keeps on giving and just literally never stops if, if, it's, if it's utilized that way. Excellent. Evan, wave your magic wand. What would you like to see? Um, well, I would say to, to my previous point, I would love to see the private sector uh, find a way to get funding into the system focused on affordable housing. So, or, or more actively building it, but definitely money. I, I know how these deals work. I've watched particularly the other side of where, you know, uh, my department. We've got to help close the gap on a lot of these projects. It's a pretty simple, you know, the loss in rent over time is, is something that when you're a developer's looking at a spreadsheet, we've got to find a way to fill that gap. So I think the private sector helping with that is great. The other thing I would say, just from a planning perspective, uh, magic wand, this doesn't sound very magical, but if y'all could show up at every single board of county commissioner, city commission, council meeting, advocating for new development, new residential development, standing up and saying that against the opposition and saying that we support this because we know it's economic development. That would be huge. We have had too many uh, projects throughout the county, not just in the county, but in municipalities that get turned down, good projects that take a lot of time to put together because of opposition. And who doesn't show up is the business community. We don't get the folks coming to, I know Clearwater's far, trust me, for, you, for those of you who are doing county stuff. But, but you know, I mean, you can call in on Zoom. Like, we have a Zoom line for every single board meeting now. I would love to have 20 people from a chamber uh, on that phone waiting to make the board say, all right, are you all gonna say the same thing? Because we get it, there's 25 business, you know, because it's a big deal. Because people, elected politicians react to those moments in the opposition they hear from. And we need to hear more from the business community who needs that housing. And the anti-density enthusiasts are more likely to show up than people yeah, who absolutely, think absolutely. it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Coquina Key Shopping Center, I'm just saying. Okay, Sean, go ahead. Your big magic wand idea. Yeah, this is a Jason Mathis special. I said there's no silver bullet. And he goes, give me one idea. Um, if, I ha if you gave me you know, one, God. I okay, two. Well, fund Habitat, that would be not one. Um, give all the money to Habitat. <laughs> That's my one. Um, but seriously, um, that is serious. The other one would be, I would probably just, if you could, give me my, a red pen and get rid of the, the regulation, right? Or reduce the regulation, which I think if you do more things by right, uh, you have less of the opportunity um, for the not my backyard or, or things to happen. But there are so many things that I believe um, from all levels, from a funding perspective, from a regulatory uh, zoning perspective, from a finance perspective that have regulations that were put in place for a wide variety of reasons but inhibit development. Um, and we're a peninsula on a peninsula, um, and we are a victim of our own success, and we all hope in this room we will continue that success. So if we do not build and allow people to build at all levels, um, this problem's just gonna continue. Excellent. Kim, I will turn it over to you. Yes, yes. So, we wanted to give you all ample time to ask questions. We have a microphone here. Please don't be shy. I can come to you. But this is an important conversation where you have expertise in the room. And I'll kick it off and start with the education piece. At St. Pete College, we have a strong workforce program. We've been great beneficiaries of workforce dollars. And we, are, we educate a lot of students who have the challenges that you all are talking about. They're here, they wanna stay here, they love it here. 
Um, they contribute vastly to our community and our county, and they're generational, but they don't have a place to live. How do you educate, how the information that we're talking about here, how do we get it out to the everyday person, understanding bank hurdles, understanding county challenges, understanding the wonderful benefits that um, Habitat does in a digestible space, and it trickles down? So I've talked about this a lot in various groups and, and spaces. We talk a lot about pathways. So we need a pathway to success. We need a pathway to education. We need a pathway to jobs. We need a pathway to housing. We need to really, to your point, build super highways, right? It needs to be well lit, well traveled. You know, a path is something off in the woods that you're lucky to stumble on and maybe you find your way. A super highway is something people can get on. You might be in the fast lane, you might be uh, taking the exit, but it's where you have to go. So I think there needs, you know, again, there has to be alignment um, and then, you know, that really becomes a marketing, marketing effort um, to, to make it accessible. Uh, but we need to stop looking at pathways and, and looking at a broader, like, super highway of this is how you get to housing, this is how you get to workforce, this is how you get to education, whatever it may be. Luis. Yeah, I, I would just say, um, I'm glad you said super highways, though I'd prefer light rail vehicles. <laughs> but as an urban planner. It'd take too long. <laughs> as an urban planner, yeah, I'm fine with uh, more sun runners, really. But um, as an urban planner, you know, we deal with the whole transportation lane use discussion all the time. We work a lot with Ford Pinellas, which is your countywide entity. And I think that um, having a robust transportation system that allows people to have some flexibility as to where to live also is a big important thing. So, you know, I work a lot in Lelman. Uh, we have a community redevelopment area down there and we're, you know, investing in everything from housing rehab to whatever. Um, Lelman's success long term is going to be its proximity to St. Pete. Pinellas Park is planning for a downtown area that they have been planning for years that's actually starting to take off because it's St. Pete's too expensive. Pinellas Park is going to try to take advantage of that fact. There's like a thousand apartments that have been built in Pinellas Park near US 19 in the last five years, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying they're cheap, but they are new dwelling units which we need. And so having a transportation system that can expand how far out I can get in 20 to 25 minutes I think makes a huge difference in the long term. You know, being able to access more of Pinellas County to uh, go work at the job centers in Gateway and St. Pete, that's huge too, because you can't expect St. Pete, if, if we're land constrained, St. Pete's even more land constrained, right? So you can't expect them to handle all the housing. The beach communities are not going to build every single unit for all the employees who work in the hotels, but we need to be able to get them over there and they need to have a decent house on the other side of the bridge decent, safe, you know, nice place to raise a family. So I think transportation, workforce training, all of that and being able to kind of connect that together is really key and looking at it holistically that way. Kim, your questions on education. Yes, really how the information trickles down for a lot of reasons, but I'll explain that after um, you answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, so I'm a native Floridian. I went to USF. I, I'm fortunate that I was able to go at a time when it didn't cost as much as it does now and how much of that cost is related to real estate too. You know, I think USF St. Pete's a great gem and it's now in one of the most expensive cities uh, in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we at the bank, we volunteer uh, to teach all kinds of individuals um, what I'll just call consumer banking, mm -hmm. um, things related to credit score, yes. Uh, I help people on the fly that are friends, and I'm not just talking about first-time homebuyers. I'm talking about a journalist friend of mine who doesn't know how credit cards work. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think they're in this, in this, in the United States as a whole. I think there is a severe neglect of financial literacy, yes. and you don't get that literacy until mistakes. Usually, yeah. unfortunately, that's the current yeah. system yes. that apparently is acceptable, and so. Um, you know, the bank, we, we have a very controlled program. We actually have a committee that I'm on. It's called our Community Reinvestment Act Committee and um, locally. And we, we provide opportunities for bankers to go out in the community and log their hours and volunteer their time and serve on boards. Mm -hmm. And we do it because we're trying to give back uh, to the community that, that, we, that we do business with. So um, education is, doesn't have to be a formal thing. It can be something that happens through the private sector and through volunteer time too. 
I definitely think it needs to happen in all corridors because it spreads out that way. Before I ask any other questions, does anyone have a question at this time? Yes, and we'd like you to go to the microphone, but if you can't make it around our maze, I'm happy to come to you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Amanda Leffler. I am a mo local mobile notary. So I see everybody from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor. Literally, I was with somebody last week that was homeless. And every, everybody in between. So um, the other thing about me is I'm a military spouse. Uh, my husband is an EOD tech in the Navy. So we've lost a lot of friends. Several of our friends have been gifted homes from organizations like Homeless Kids Help. And so I wonder, what about doing a model like that where you know, maybe nonprofits are helping raise the money to put people into homes, you know, with, or at least raising the money to help fill that gap to where now the home is affordable and people are, you know, doing it through the nonprofit end and not the government that's giving that money. That's a great question. Anyone? We do it every day. I mean, you know, that's what Habitat does. We, we you know, have great business support um, through business partners. We have governmental support, but... Um, government alone is not going to create the subsidies, right? So they're a part of, of the, the solution here, um, but private donors, businesses, other tax incentives um, are all part of that solution. Uh, but, you know, that's really focused on, and if I could just take a second here, the one thing we really didn't get into that I want everybody in the, into the room to kind of understand and know is the housing continuum. So on this side of the housing continuum, you have literally street homeless, right? And on this side, you have your market rate, $500,000 million homes, right? That's, and then you have everything in between. So when you look at the homeless system of care, you have veteran homelessness, you have individuals uh, fleeing domestic violence, you have families homelessness, you have disability and severe, that's a whole, those are all systems in itself. That's a complex thing. On the market rate side, what we're all experiencing right now is anybody looked at a starter home? What's a starter home right now going for in Pinellas County? 300. 300 is a starter home. 300, maybe five, six years ago is 175, something like that. So we took the starter home that the, the veteran, the police officer, that's, no, that's out of their, their income range, right? So now we see what happens when you, you can't get out of their rental, and now we see rental occupancies go up. So now rental units, they're 99% occupied. Well, what can landlords do then, or what happens then? We have the supply and demand. Rents go through the roof, so now you go from maybe paying 800 bucks a month to your rent doubles. Now it's 16. So now you were in a market rate rental. Now you're in the affordable rental sphere. Well, we don't have enough capacity there. We've gone over that enough and up. So what happens when you, God forbid, there's a pandemic or your car breaks down because we don't have a transportation, adequate transportation or the kids get sick. Well, now you may end up in the homeless system of care, right? And then now you're in that system and it costs money. So there's this downward pressure that happens. There's also an upward pressure because if, we, if we're not moving people out of homelessness into something semi-permanent into permanent, then that system just grows and we need to put more and more resources on that end. So I just want to kind of, it kind of struck court, like it all plays together. So when we look at a silver bullet or like, hey, we, we want to come with these takeaways, it's, it's all of the above, right? And we have to look at every portion of the market, whether it's market rate rental or market rate home ownership, market rate rental, affordable home ownership, subsidized housing, homelessness, it all is, is part of that. And I just don't want to get it lost in this conversation because all housing is, is a part of it. Um, and if we don't build enough on one end, it's going to put downward pressure um, and we're just going to be taking those resources and moving it to the more vulnerable end of the spectrum. Right now, um, we have 140 families in Pinellas County that are living on the street, street homeless, that we know of, identified. That's the number I just heard today. Um, 140 families, little kids, on the street, in cars, 
all sorts of ways. That's where we're at today, and that's who we know of. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the reality of the situation. If we can't get those families into, you know, market rate or subsidized housing, those things, those issues are just gonna grow and grow and grow, and we're gonna have to take resources from here and put them over there and continue to play that game. So I just wanna kinda give the broader spectrum of, of the, housing, what, the housing continuum and kinda how everything plays with one another, and we have to focus on all of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that too. My question was prompted by that exact scenario. Um, a lot of the service people in um, St. Petersburg experienced real challenges with um, their rent. They had had sta very stable rents for 15 years um, and were able to walk to work and enjoy a high quality of life on very little income. And um, a group of them came to me, and it's not, I'm an attorney by trade, it's not my practice of law, and they asked me, they just wanted help. They wanted to understand, could the landlord do X? because the landlords were busy doing a lot of X's. Mm -hmm. And it created so many challenges that many of them just decided, well, we have to go. So then what happens? That slippery slope you talked about, people want exceptional service. Well, you're not gonna get exceptional service, they just left. <laughs> so that creates a lot of other challenges that you're speaking of. It's this constant continual of, of trying to bring people in and the density is a huge issue of um, people who are from and of St. Pete and don't want that um, level of change and density. So definitely is something to address. I wanted to ask another question while we have, anyone else have a question? Please, thank you. Is this on? Okay. Hello, um, I'm Heidi Cornell. I'm the executive director for Daystar Life Center in uh, St. Petersburg. We serve all of Pinellas County. Um, I'm here tonight because this is a critical issue for our neighbors and our community that we serve at the center. Um, this year alone, to put some things in perspective, I know we're talking about housing, but when we talk about housing, we have to talk about rental housing as well, affordable. Um, Pinellas County, um, particularly the St. Petersburg area, is now 9.9% .9 above the national average for um, affordability in housing. Um, that's, a, that's an alarming number, and that increased just this year alone. Um, and I know there's the complicated issues, and I see the, I see the, uh, the, the Ellis um, clientele. Um, so, you know, I'm on the lower end of that, of that continuum. This year we paid, we, we, we made a concerted effort to try to help as many people as possible, right? We vet out all of our clients. Um, we provide rental assistance, utility assistance. Um, what we're seeing is an increase in so many needs um, and people coming to the center. We have a food pantry. Our food pantry um, clientele has increased by almost 50% this year, okay? where we're seeing some days 120, and people can only get pantry assistance once a month. And some days we have 125 individuals who are showing up at our pantry. Why? Because they're making critical decisions. Um, do I pay my mortgage this month? Do I pay my rent this month? Do I pay my utility bill? Or do I feed my family? I don't know. Um, we're seeing, we paid 2,500 utility bills this year. Um, that might not sound like a lot, but compared to two years ago, where we paid less than a thousand, that's a big increase. So this is a very critical issue. We need to come up with some kind of solution. Um, and some of the things we talk about at the center is why, and I know we don't want to include government and all of that, we're trying to talk about private sector. However, when there's so many incentives to continuously increase because you know there's not a, there's not a ceiling. Um, I come from New York, and there are ceilings in place. You can raise your rent incrementally year to year, but you can't raise your rent, you know, eight percent in a year. I mean, we have people whose rent has been raised almost you know six to seven hundred dollars from year to year. I mean, that's that's incredible. That that's just 
So we, we, we need, I, and I wish I, I mean, I'm new to the area, but I wish I, it took me two years to find a house <laughs> because I couldn't afford half of them. But um, yeah, so I, I, that's why we're here. And I w we would love to partner with anybody and work with anybody to help find solutions because, you know, we have 60,000 people that the center touched this year uh, that need this assistance. Thank you. I think we have one other question here. Hi, I'm Lindsay Cross. I'm a newly elected representative from this area, and I've been in this community for about 20 years, and I remember when the Department of Community Affairs was active, and we looked at developments of regional impact. Um, you alluded to uh, rating the Sadowski Affordable Trust Fund. There's a permanent 50% sweep that was put in place um, the previous legislative year. We also see rating of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is also comes from uh, document, documentary stamp taxes. I also understand that there's been limits to how much municipalities can charge an impact fees to developers, which makes it more difficult to keep up with infrastructure and upgrading or putting in new roads or schools. Are there any specific policies or regulations or preemptions that you've seen maybe in the past five years that if those were repealed could help communities, particularly in these more urban areas, to increase stock and make it easier for true affordable housing, uh, below market rate to come in rather than just the high-end development? Well, I can tell you uh, to repeat something that's been said, you know, density, it's, it's really shocking that I live, I just bought a new house that I was under contract for two years ago. It's the only way I can afford it, by the way. And I see the Sunrunner drive by all the time with people on it. And I'm just continually shocked that the city of St. Petersburg did not anticipate um, this new gem of moving people from areas like West St. Pete, which are expensive, but not as expensive as near downtown and adjacent to downtown, there was absolutely no planning ahead of this um, to increase density where folks don't need a car, right? You don't need a garage, you don't need a car. If you're able to hop on the Sunrunner, go to work, hang out at the beach on the weekend, and then come party in downtown St. Pete on the weekend. That's your insurance payment, your car payment, all that stuff out the window. And so local governments on a blanket level, I don't think are, are thinking that way because it hasn't. they haven't had to do that. You mentioned DCA that was removed when uh, Governor Rick Scott came into office. So there, you know, you're under a lot of stresses. I'll give you some numbers real quick. So St. Pete used to have 1,000 people move to it every year, 10,000 a year. Right before COVID, we had this at the Downtown Partnership presentation. There was 1,500 before COVID. There was only about 1,000 living units, new living units for people to live in of any kind, single family homes, apartments, rentals out there. And now with COVID, I have no idea what that number is because there, haven't, there hasn't been a lot of data. And so how do you make it work? And um, I think density is honestly one of the quickest places that you could do that. But the issues that I think people run up against are just like has been stated earlier, that people come out in opposition or there's a specific project and there's one objection to it. And so it creates that feeling that I hear from developers who are like, well, I don't wanna fight that battle. I can go do luxury housing and I'll make lots of money and I'll live my life. And so those are the choices that that the private sector is doing, and how do you affect that is, is to do density, to make the math work, or to do certain things like I was talking about. But those are just my solutions that I see as pretty, I would say relatively low-hanging fruit. I know there's a process, and there's all these regulatory things that city governments have to do to go through for that, but it would be something that I think would immediately impact you know, a community, especially along those transportation corridors. Yeah. Uh I would say it's hard. I mean, there's a lot of uh, state legislation over the last 10 years that's, you know, preempted local government. And, and frankly, I'm not, I'm not a, I think that uh, maybe when DCA was kind of disbanded or changed greatly and turned into something much less, um, I wasn't necessarily against some of that. And it's because I happen to work in urban areas in Florida and I know that the urban counties are very competent at understanding how to address growth problems and growth challenges. Now what I see, uh, now I do see 
rural areas. Rural areas had big challenges where they didn't have the capacity to address major developments coming in the middle of the state, right? But Pinellas and Hillsborough haven't had that problem as much. Um, so I, f I feel like, uh, you know, I feel like right now what I see is now there's this, it's, it's almost a distrust at some level that urban counties, urban big cities like St. Pete and so forth don't want to um, increase density, increase affordable housing, um, be more flexible. So now what we get is we're getting um, some state legislative, you know, whether it's sometimes rumor, sometimes it's just a change of the law, that takes some of our ability away to be flexible in certain circumstances. And it's, it could even be well-intentioned trying to accomplish the same thing, but I do think there's this need for on the urban side of things and some of the more urban counties there's a great desire to try to we are not anti-development at the county we 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 know we have issues and we know we need to educate and etc but i think sometimes some of those laws complicate complicate things that we may have already been working on or we're already interested in so maybe can't really speak to a specific piece of it but that seems to be you know, there's well-intentioned stuff trying to increase development right now coming out of Tallahassee at times, but it's also preempting some of the local stuff that may have already been working or in process or stuff like that. So that, that happens a lot. I will give you a good piece of legislation that's come out the last couple of years is House Bill 1339, Senate Bill 962, which the city of St. Pete was the first in the state to enact, which basically allowed streamlined rezoning um, for affordable housing. Now, that being said, they're the only ones in the communities probably a year ago to, to have that happen. So why Clearwater hasn't done it, why Pinellas County, I believe I asked Evan this specifically, what's going on, and if you want to hear a kick rocks from a, a uh, city municipal employee, they go, oh, we need to study that, right? So that see in two years. That's, you know, that's what we're getting right now, and we're on an active kind of little mini crusade to say, hey, this is a tool in the toolbox. Most of the stuff that Tallahassee has done over the past few years have, have preempted. I know rent control, that was kind of where you were headed. That's preemptive, inclusionary zoning, all these kind of other things. This is one of the tools in the toolbox that the, the legislature has said, hey, government, do less government things. And our local governments have said, well, we need to study this. We need to look more into it, except for St. Pete, who now has a project coming out of the ground that you, you know most are aware this is going to be 400 units, something like that, that would never have happened or would have been still in the development planning phase uh, if not for this law or, or regulation. So I would say we already have something that's on the books right now that Pinellas County can act, can act, get, that Largo can enact, that Clearwater can act, that all the municipalities locally, that won't, it's again, not going to be the silver bullet, but it'll help around the edges and it'll take that project that Traditionally, to get something rezoned from, just think about it, retail to residential for the most part, think about all, where's retail right now? On the corridors, US 19 and wherever else. Where is that gonna be, what's that Kmart already gone, Walmart gonna be in 30 years, 20 years? They're empty, they're parking lots, right? So why, why that, to rezone that right now is probably at best in a municipality 12 months? 18 months, depending on, at best, right? So you take that and all the risk involved and the market changing and financing and all that kind of stuff, you can take that 12 month process and really turn it to three months. And St. Pete has done that and there's a model there that cities can just say, hey, let's just take it if we wanna tweak it a little bit. So there, there's things there that Tallahassee has done recently to help uh, specifically, and it's only for affordable housing, that's the other thing I want to mention in it. It's not any development, it's a development that has a certain percent or 100% affordable. So that is something if you want to take away, like I would go back to your elected officials uh, in your towns and cities, municipalities you live with and say, hey, are we doing this? Yes or no? If it's no, why not? How do we get involved? That's like an easy, low-hanging fruit takeaway uh, that can, we can all work on throughout the county. I'm very lucky to have Sean on my affordable housing advisory committee uh, who will be addressing these code changes in the coming year, right, Sean? 
last time I'm pretty sure you said we're looking into that or listen, some. Listen. I'm like, it's well, right and, here. And, and, and I will say this on that. I agree that there is a lot of opportunity with that particular, with, the, with those bills that came down. And I will say that the county commission in Pinellas County has had a long standing um, policy as it relates to employment land, industrial land particularly, because once you give it industrial land up, it doesn't come back, right? Now with that, what's going on at the county level, and he's heard all this, is there is, there is a study from Ford Pinellas, and they are basically are in the process, and they have been for a year, updating what are our target industries, what are, what actually, are we even talking about industrial anymore? And so they're wrapping up their study, and they're gonna come out with recommendations, and then ultimately what we will do is adjust our code accordingly, and hopefully take advantage of some of these new things that the state has put into place. So. I, I agree. I think that uh, St. Pete had a really good opportunity and was able to take advantage of it um, because of that one site. And I think that it will happen in the county certainly soon. I haven't, I'm not really aware of where the, the municipalities are about with it, with that particular legislation. And that's why Evan's good at his job. Did you hear that? It was blah, 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 blah. We're waiting on a study, right? <laughs> so that's where I, we're I'm going to allow you to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 He's waiting on a study. Yeah. I, <laughs> No, I, I'm honestly watching it live. Uh, the Warehouse Arts District has a ton in St. Pete, has a ton of vacant land. So nothing's being done with this property now. And it's zoned industrial, like strict, like machinery only. And so there are developers who are buying up that land. They want to keep jobs there. They want to have some sort of retail component, industrial component. But they also want housing. And when you have housing that close to the Sun Runner and what I will also call the fun zone, you've got all kinds of fun places to live and eat and ha live your life with you and your family and visitors who come through. That's what works, right? That's where people don't always have to get in their cars, which lowers the amount they have to spend, which keeps more savings for them. And so I, I think that the more that is probably one area which I think it's been said quite a bit, but you know, coming up with creative solutions because there are folks out there who want to build cool structures that people feel happy to live in in a community where they feel at home where they can work and they have a job nearby. And um, it's just I, I, it's just a paradigm shift. Like, if you think about it, it's like if you bought a car for 22000 and then five years later the same car is $30,000. you are like, what's, what, what's new in the car? And you're like, no, nothing really. Just the inputs have completely changed. Like, no one wants to hear that. And so what you have to do is find a way to deal with that and make the car or the, the universe work, I guess. And, you know, I think that's where we're all at. And I, my takeaway from the conversation tonight is that a lot of people are talking about this, coming at it from very different angles. And if you throw 18 things up in the air, one of them, one of them is going to work, or two or three. And then you double down on those. Forever. Um, I, 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 I do have... <laughs> we cut you off. Hello, hello. There we go. No, um, you know, we talked again about education. I talked about getting the business community involved. Again, we tend to only be in these rooms when we have a crisis and having these conversations. I promise you from, I will look back and government is all process all the time. That's what we do, right? And it takes a while. But I promise you if we come back in a year, I'll be able to run off another 10 things that we've done in the year to help facilitate housing and everything else. I can make more of those things happen if I get more of the stakeholders involved from the business community, from the private sector, and not just, you know, my friend here uh, yelling at me all the time, but people who are like, hey, I know you're trying, I know it's complicated, I know what's going on. I need you all aware. I need you all aware of what we have to do and the different steps that have to go through it. And uh, I think you'll see a big change. But it does, on that continuum of care idea, I mean, I think, and this is said a lot, uh, if we don't fund housing, if we don't fund services, we'll fund it on police. So we're paying for it no matter what, in one way or the other. So as soon as we accept that, I think together as a community and decide it's a lot better to fund housing or to help facilitate housing, and uh, as soon as we do that more collectively, I think we're gonna be able to make some of these bigger uh, changes uh, moving forward, so. Okay, Sean, in fairness, you can say one more thing, but it has to be quick. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. We wanted this conversation. Over the past year, our team has sat in on countless meetings regarding housing. 
but we didn't have the conversation with the stakeholders in the room to really explain the complexity and for you all to hear their collective voices. That is what the Institute does. That's what we're proud to continue to do. We're open to have these uh, another continued series if you all are open to it, but we're grateful for your time tonight. Again, since this is one of our last programs, we have one more tomorrow at 7 a.m. Um, I wanna take the time to thank my team who worked so incredibly hard um, throughout this entire year. To, we have a small but mighty team and they work really, really hard. So I wanna publicly thank them for all that they do to make the Institute run. And I wanna thank you all for continuing the conversation. Um, we have our social media, so go fast. <laughs> Um, if you want to learn more about the Institute, we are out there. Please go to our website, go to Facebook, go to Instagram. More importantly, come to our programs and tell us what you want to hear or talk about. Thank you so much for your time and good night. <laughs>